that the first century church from our studies practiced communion on a weekly basis. So to pattern ourselves after the first century church as well as the apostles teaching, we have communion every week. Now some churches and some individuals will criticize saying that that makes communion too repetitious or make it lose meaning. Well, for the Christian churches we disagree. We believe it provides a renewed strength weekly. As we meet around this table, and if you do so in the right frame of mind, you'll leave stronger than when you got here. And we believe it brings to, as a reminder of Christ's sacrifice for us. We do not make communion a test of fellowship. So it's not an, it's up to you, <clears throat> it's not up to me. Whenever I've been asked about this, well what about a child taking that is uh, not yet been baptized or anything? Your, your partaking and participation in the Lord's Supper is totally between you and God. The church, me or our elders, should not interfere. It is His table, not ours. So we encourage that participation to be upon you. Many years ago, though, I took a page out of the denominational world and planned one Sunday a year for a more in-depth finely focused communion service. Now I chose the first Sunday in December. That was my choice. And I chose the first Sunday in December. And some would say, well that's the busiest time of year. You got Thanksgiving and then we have communion and then you have Christmas. Exactly. If you want something done, where do you go? To the busiest person you know. And when's the best time to remember communion? Whenever I have a time of Thanksgiving and a time of blessings. <clears throat> because that's what communion is really all about. Thanksgivings and blessings. I also believe that preaching has to be an educational tool. So I want to use it today to help us understand communion. Communion is not a rich, ritual nor sure should it be considered as such. So with all those things said, I want to take you to back to the Passover. Back to the Passover. Passover, a remembrance, a remembrance. Early on God wanted His people to remember Him and what He has done for them. For instance, let's go back to the, the time of bondage in Egypt. If we go back to that time, you'll remember it started with Joseph going to Egypt and he was well respected by Pharaoh of the day and it was a, a fantastic type of event. Uh, it was something that went very well in the the people prospered and did well. But it, the scripture will say in the first chapter of Exodus that the time would come that that king and Pharaoh would die and the new one didn't know who Joseph was and he was afraid of the overwhelming number of the Israelites. So he put them in captivity and he assigned uh, slave drivers to really take care of them. I'd like to read a, an excerpt before we get to that one from Exodus chapter 3 verses 7 and 8 would say this. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land into the good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 9, And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. I have seen the way of the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of bondage. Now let's go to Exodus chapter 12 verse 17. Celebrate the feast of unleavened bread because it was on this very day that I brought your division out of Egypt. Celebrating this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. I want you to consider with me after the bondage, the captivity that had taken place. It has become uh, poor conditions. The living conditions are terrible. The hard work that has been uh, put upon the people. They're making bricks and giant monuments for Egypt. The hunger, they're building cities for Pharaoh. The hunger though that these people are suffering from, the Israelite people are suffering, is overwhelming. There's no freedom. In fact, Pharaoh has given orders that the firstborn, or the males, have to be destroyed. 
he has ordered that that should transpire. If you remember, the midwife said, no, we won't do that, and that the uh, Israelite women are faster in birth than the Egyptian women, and we can't get there in time. And God, the scripture says, God blessed them and didn't make that transpire. But later, Pharaoh must have seen through it, and he ordered that all families would get rid of their male children. Now that takes us to the time of Moses. Remember the story of Moses? So mom looked upon Moses and he was a beautiful baby boy. And she put him in a basket and set him into the Nile. And we say, well now, wait, there's crocodiles and all the stuff that go in the river. Mother was a woman of faith. A woman of faith. She trusted God with her newborn. Even though she hadn't seen where he was going, hadn't seen what was going to transpire, she trusted God. And in trusting God, great events started unfolding. It's been 400 years, 400 years of bondage and slavery and suffering and abuse that the Israelite people have suffered. And now we know about all the plagues and all that's going to transpire with them. And the last plague, the last plague is going to be the blood upon the doorpost. The blood upon the doorpost. And without that blood, that home would not be spared. The firstborn of that home would not be spared. Saved by the blood. Saved by the blood that God had told them must transpire and must take place. Now for all of Egypt, they weren't aware of the instructions of God. And what happened? It didn't even, uh, the, the, the palace was not even immune from what was going to transpire. The firstborn of Pharaoh would die. And Pharaoh would finally turn the Israelite people loose. But he didn't like it. And we know the rest of the story that he would challenge them, he would chase after them, and then he would drown in the Red Sea, or his army would. Now that we're past all of that, why did they celebrate? Well, this verse that we just had has just told you that. To remember their freedom and that God's gift of life. Folks, they only had an existence in Egypt. They didn't really have life. They went from work, long, hard hours of slavery, back to the poorest of ghettos that you can imagine. God did not want them to forget, though, their bondage. I want you to remember what they had to remember. I want you just to remember from what you've seen in Scripture. I want you to think about how terribly oppressed they were. And he didn't want to forget. God did not want them to forget who had provided for them. Exodus chapter 12 verses 26 and 27 will say this. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them. It is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the house of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshipped. What does Passover mean? He said, tell your children. <laughs> tell your children what was transpiring. That they were saved by the blood. The blood God had for them. <clears throat> So now the events have started to be put into place of what's going to take place and how it's going to happen. It was a message that they were to pass down generation to generation because God wanted every house, every home to know. He didn't want a single Israelite to forget. He didn't want them to forget the terrible circumstances that they lived in and where they were without God. In Exodus chapter 12 verse 11 it will say this, this is how you are to eat it with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So how were they to partake? Prepared. Prepared. Now why did they do these things that we've just read? Because once the death angel had passed over, once the angel of death had passed over uh, their homes, God had told them, be ready. Be ready. You may have to flee Egypt instantly, right then, right now. So he had them partake, prepared. So that's how they partake of the Passover. Now, they were prepared to flee Egypt. Don't come to the table unprepared, he would tell them. For generations, 
Israel has celebrated Passover. The Jewish people have celebrated Passover. Passover is still a practice to this very day for the Jewish people. And for the good Jewish home, the Orthodox home, they still eat it prepared to flee. It's part of their, their ceremony of remembering. They're, they're dressed, they're ready, their shoes are on. They're not overly comfortable. So what does all of that have to do with communion? It was during the time of Passover that Jesus would institute what we have known as communion. What he instituted as the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way after supper he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Taking communion is a privilege, not a ritual. So why do we partake? Folks, whenever you come around this table today, whenever the emblems are passed to you, it's going to be very important that we are able to remember. That we are to remember what God has done and is doing for us. So let me ask you today, what do you remember? The very first thing he says to remember, verse 24, he would say the bread, that this represents his body. So if we was to represent this as the body of Christ, which we do, let me ask you this. What do you remember about the life of Christ? Now I'm not asking about his sacrifice. What do you remember about the life of Jesus? Do you have a favorite story in the New Testament that you really like in the Gospels? Is there a favorite point that you like whenever Jesus maybe was sitting with thousands of people listening to him? Is there one of those favorite stories that's just so meaningful to you that you read it over and over again? You all know I like the story of Jesus walking on the water. Or maybe it was the time whenever Jesus would, the children were going to come to him and the disciples had tried to stop them. He said, oh don't hinder the children, don't stop them, let them come to me. And Jesus laid his hand upon them. What do you remember about Jesus' life? Not his death. What do you remember about his life? What special part of the life of Jesus just jumps out at you today? Is there one particular thing? Maybe it was whenever he was a 12 year old boy. I really like this one. It took me a long time to study. Uh, it was just continual preparation. And Deb kept putting me through school and putting me through school uh, and helping me get there. I like it whenever Jesus is 12 years old and he's in the temple and he's teaching. And I'm thinking, wow, that's pretty good stuff. What's your favorite in Scripture? What's your favorite section of the Gospel? Do you like one Gospel better than the other? I personally read Matthew more than I read any other Gospels. Now I don't exactly know why, I just like Matthew. I've got to where I've really built a new appreciation for John. But at Christmas, who do we focus on? Luke. So where's your favorite section? If we come every Sunday and we remember something about the life of Jesus, your communion can take on a whole new meaning for you. It'll have a whole new special atmosphere about it. A whole new special relationship that God wants you to have. If you can remember something about His life. Now let's go back to Passover. As they were eating the Passover meal. There had been the, the Paschal lamb, um, the sweet and bitter herbs, and they put door over the blood, blood over the doorpost. What do you think they were remembering? I suspect that they were remembering their bondage. My opinion. But yet, <clears throat> perhaps Moses' family at the time of Passover going, that's my son. They may have been remembering how God had used this baby that had been put in a basket. <coughs> there was something good that they remembered and something bad that they remember. They may have remembered how Egypt started out as a very good place for them under Joseph, at least according to their ancestors of years past. I want you to remember today something about Jesus' life. As you take the bread, I want you to remember that He lived for you. 
but he also died for you. Verse 25 would be the, the next part of the verse. In the same way after supper he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. What do you remember about the sacrifice? Now I want you to consider the sacrifice because if I ask you what you remember about the sacrifice, most of you are going to talk about the cross and the brutality of that. But let's go back a little farther. Maybe we go back into his life. Jesus lived such a humble life. Foxes have dens, but Jesus didn't have a place to lay his head. He lived such a humble life. And this could have been a magnificent life for him. It was a magnificent life for him, by the way. But he could have lived the riches upon riches upon riches. He was the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Anything he would have spoke could have come into existence. He was God in the flesh. But he chose humility. He wasn't born to the finest places. It was a manger. And we're going to celebrate that, of course, this time of year. Maybe we think about his poverty. How poor he was. From place to place, preaching. Maybe it's the trials that he went through. Even after doing a very good thing, what did they want to do? They wanted to throw him off the cliff back in his home area. And yet he had done some very good things. He was able to cast demons out. He was able to raise the dead. But he went through trials because people were threatened by him. Or perhaps it is the beating and the cross that we remember most about his sacrifice for us. But in our communion service, we realize that we're talking about life and death. Life and death. Very much like it was with Passover. Except for this is our type of Passover. That we do this in remembrance of Him. Not just remembering the cruelty of it, but remembering that here's a Savior who loved us so much that He gave His life on our behalf. So what does communion mean? Verse 26 would say this. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Tell of His love. We're proclaiming until He comes. His love. We are proclaiming the, the death of Christ that He loved us so much until He comes. So every time you take communion, you should be realizing that we are making a proclamation. That's why this service is so important that we're doing. There is no greater love than what Jesus showed for us. It was love for the Father. Oh, how He loved His Heavenly Father. And whenever he had this mission, and his father sent him on a mission to earth, sure enough, he fulfilled that mission. But he had such a great love for the mankind that he found here, that creation that he and the father had done. Even with all of our faults and our warts, he still died for us. And then finally, just like the Israelites, we have to ask ourselves the question, how are we to partake? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 29 through 27. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. To partake, we are to be prepared. Prepared. Don't come around the Lord's table unprepared. Don't come around the Lord's table with hate or anger or pouting, being unfocused, rushed, or mean-spirited, rude. Don't come around the Lord's table in those manners. We've often seen such activities. Now let me ask you, whenever you are invited to someone else's table, now this is just the Lord's table. If you are invited to someone else's table, don't you hate it? When you get there and the kids are pouting at the end of the table. Yeah, their lip is hanging, they're mad, they didn't want to give up the TV to come in and sit down. Don't you hate it whenever someone starts saying, well, I don't like the way they did the sweet potatoes. Well, big deal. Don't you hate it when someone will say, you know, I really don't like those people down the street. Well, good news, they don't like you either. 
None of us like those type of conversations, do we? It just steals from the whole meal. Today, whenever we come around the Lord's table, it should not be with hate or anger or pouting. It shouldn't be unfocused, rushed, mean-spirited or rude. It's not a game. It's not rushed. Because the scripture says, don't eat and drink damnation unto yourself. So whenever we pass the emblem, it's so important that we do this in a manner that's worthy of Christ. Now I personally, this is not me imposing upon you, but I personally prepare for communion. I don't like someone to pick me on the shoulder and talk to me during that time. I prepare for communion. It's a very special time for me. I always look forward to a communion service, whether it's the first Sunday of December or mid-July. It's important. So whenever we come, we do this in remembrance of Him. In conclusion today, I say this. I must remember. I personally like the way the Christian church, the Church of Christ, pattern themselves with a weekly communion. It reminds me. See, folks, I don't want to forget. I have a tendency to forget. Does that happen to anyone else? And the older Deb gets, the more I forget. So, uh, it's probably because we're aging together. But anyway, I have a tendency at times to forget. I may have a tendency to take things for granted at times. I don't want to do those things. I cannot do that around this table. I can never forget his great love for me. And I can't take for granted that he owed me this because he did not. I don't want it to ever be where I am not remembering his life and his sacrifice. I must remember. No one ever loved me like Jesus did. And here's the good news. No one's ever loved you like Jesus does. No one ever loved you more. You may think that your spouse has loved you more than anyone else in the world. That's not true. You may think that your parents loved you more than anyone else in the world. That's not true. Jesus loved you more than anyone else that's ever walked this earth. And he gave us all. We're going to prepare for that time of communion. If you're one who are to be able to, one of the servers today, I'd ask you to go to the back at this time. There is no rush or no hurry. Whenever the emblems are passed to you, just remember, He loved you. And He said, remember me. That's all He's asking today is so that whenever you come around this table that you will remember. Will you please bow with me for a word of prayer. Our God and our Father, we come before your throne and we will remember. Oh, we'll remember how Jesus walked this earth and preached those sermons and how all of this was recorded so that we could know how much He's loved us. We'll remember His life as a 12-year-old boy teaching the teachers and we'll remember how the day He smiled as the children were wanting to come to Him. He said, don't stop them. Let them come to me. We'll remember how He patiently instructed the disciples who could be so impatient we will remember a life that has touched ours. And God, as we take of the cup, we remember that that person living that life loved us so much that he humbled himself in every manner of his life, all the way to the cross. Humbly going to the cross when he could have rebelled, and we'll remember. So as we take this loaf and take this cup, may we do so, remembering in Jesus' name, amen.